what I'm going to be talking about is, is mostly going to be uh, computer software. Um, uh, that's what I've done for most of my career. Um, on the Unexplained project, uh, at the start of the project we didn't have robots, we didn't have anything, um, so we needed to develop um, the post-processing software um, applications that we expected to need uh, during the project. Um, so we started by defining data standards, uh, data file, um, naming formats and so on. Um, data conversion requirements uh, we worked out uh, with the robotics people. Um, we settled on a database management system uh, and then uh, went ahead to develop a few of the post-processing applications that we were expecting to need. Uh, and then, as we started to get data in from the pilot uh, tests, uh, we needed to go into more detailed uh, modeling, point count applications, visualization, and, and that's where uh, I'm going to hand over to him. So, we started with the data transfer and storage. Uh, data comes from the robots in um, ROS bag format, ROS robot operating system. Um, it's based on Linux. Um, and uh, the ROS bag format is complex, uh, so the first thing we need to do is convert it into fairly standard formats like CSV, uh, text format, uh, JPEG graphics, and AVI for videos. Um, and large data volumes that we were expecting, uh, we made a decision quite early that we were going to hold these in robust, robust disk drives, external disk drives, military specifications, so you know, these are even waterproof, which they need to be. Um, and we keep copies of these in separate locations as required by the data management program. Data management system we decided on using uh, SQLite, which is not one of the, uh, the best known uh, systems in the industry, but it is the most widely used. It's an open source, um, public domain uh, database system, which is used in uh, a lot of smartphones. There's uh, an installed user base around the world in uh, many millions. So it's probably the most robust database management system there is. Software development um, into two <coughs> database man data analysis methods um, that we were going to use. Uh, we started with the, the multispectral data. Um, calibration uh, used a set of standard reference minerals, um, and uh, calibration runs were done from early days of the project, uh, first of all in a lake in Hungary. Uh, and then later on in Idria Bain um, and in Katiala. Uh, so we have a set of calibration data that we used for the multispectral data and a number of processing options that we explored and have implemented. Um, we've worked with uh, Geological Survey of Slovenia on uh, developing these. Uh, Slovenia provided a neural network intelligence um, and uh, that evolved into a, an application for calcite detection uh, which we knew was going to be important for Hector. And sub-bottom sonar data, um, we have developed a visualization uh, for for this uh, sub-bottom sonar data, either standard wiggly line plots as used in seismic or color plots uh, which are commonly used on uh, GPR, ground processing radar, yeah, ground penetrating radar. And the first tests of the multi-beam multi sonar data we ran um, from um, the Katiala project, um, yeah, the, uh, on the, on the left is the, the uh, actual data. On the right is a picture of uh, the Katiala pit as it was before it was flooded. Uh, so the, uh, you can see that the, uh, the opening on the, on the plot on the left matches the right-hand opening in the photo. And structural 
Regional Geology, based on point cloud data. Um, we developed software or adapted software for um, identification and uh, highlighting of uh, structural features. We also looked at uh, using photogrammetry <coughs> as, a, as a method for generating point clouds. Uh, we had used this already uh, on surface features uh, at Acton Mine, um, and it worked very well. We produced 3D models of, uh, of walls and buildings. Uh, we then tried it underground and found that it was not quite so successful there because it's very dependent on um, constant level of illumination. But we plan to persevere with that uh, and we'll carry on in the UNXUP project um, and, uh, and we'll try to, try to make this, this work because it's a very easy way of producing uh, good point clouds which are linked back to the, the original photo. It's working. Is that better? No. Uh, <laughs> I'll shout.
So the next part was actually using the data. Um, so my, my own software, it's called Eureka, is a uh, geological holding software, but it, it wasn't really geared towards um, any of the data processing that we're doing within our next step. Um, some things we could use, but uh, a lot of things needed to be developed to, to, to be able to use it within the software. And the first part was handling these massive point clouds. Um, at an early stage, we, we got some uh, example data already through other means, um, so we could start playing with that early on. And a typical way of dealing with these large uh, point clouds is to subdivide space into little blocks and process these blocks uh, individually. And that's called octree encoding. Um, processing uh, that in itself uh, takes quite a bit of time and also then visualizing each of the blocks individually and I'll show you an example a little bit how it works in practice in a minute um, it has its own challenges but at the start of the project we also decided that a good way to visualize it would be through virtual reality um, as we've mentioned before it's a flood of mine can't actually go down there, except uh, maybe in some cases an astronaut can go there, um, but there's no way for a normal geologist to go down to the side and observe what's going on. Um, so the only way to, to uh, virtually go there is through virtual reality. Um, we've demonstrated this at the, the Blend workshop and also demonstrated at the uh, PDSC uh, last year, uh, this year and EIT last year, just to, to get people's um, impressions. And the first thing that people have when they experience virtual reality with these this sorts of data is like, whoa, this is something completely different. And immediately people want to do things like, ah, oh, can we look at the structural angle here, or can we see things, can we annotate it? Um, we've done some work on that already, but um, that, that's still the, in the early stages. Um, other parts, which We've seen a bit of an example is looking at structural planes within the data, so we, we needed to be able to, to deal with these massive point clouds and extract uh, structural information from it. So we've got, um, we're using that same subdivision of space to actually extract structural planes from the data quite quickly, um, doing fly through animation, so I'll show you a little bit of what that does. Um, but also, one of the things that we we want to do quite early on um, is to associate all the information, all the geological information that we can get with these point clouds. Um, so we, we've, we've done some coding where we can actually project the images from electric cameras, UV cameras, normal cameras, and also multispectral back onto the point clouds. So you can actually switch between um, different color information. And finally, um, we've had a bit of a look at uh, what output, uh, output could be useful. Uh, so either 3D printing, uh, glass blocks is uh, something that we've uh, tried and uh, looked at holograms. Right, uh, in this case, this is a bit of, a, of an example of, of a point cloud. So this is a faro scan that was done um, above the water level. This is the, the biggest data set that we've had um, that we could use for um, point cloud processing. And this is actually showing how uh, a data set of 550 million points can actually be run on a, on a laptop, so you can actually start zooming in and looking at the data. And it, it's sort of the end goal where we want to get to um, within our next step. Because if, if we can get this level of accuracy, you can see all the, the nice structure in the data, and you can start using that information. So th this has been a challenge in itself, just importing um, these massive amounts of data. Um, just to give you a bit of an example, if you have uh, one of these subsets, so in this case, this whole data set is about 12 scans, each, uh, each scan is about uh, 40 million points, but every point has three coordinates, every, so x, y, z, every coordinate takes about 8 bytes of data, so if you have 40 million points, put the times 8, 320 million uh, bytes of data, um, times 3, and that's just for, for one of these subsets. And so we, we needed to figure out how we could compress that to make it suitable in such a way that you can actually use, uh, use it. So we've we now managed to include the process within uh, the modeling so software. 
So we can actually start using the modeling capabilities of the software with, uh, with these data sets. Just, ah, I can't say this. Moving on. So this is actually um, being positioned inside the tunnel. This is hopefully what we'll get to uh, well, in the next couple of years with the uh, other job to, to get to this level of detail. Right, so the last part of our work in the post processing um, is handling these big point clouds. And like anybody working with big data sets, so you, the first thing you try to do is throw as many as much as you can. Um, you only want to keep the important bit. So dealing with hundreds of millions of points, you can't really cope with it much. So what you do is you, you, you try to filter out points that are important, all the, the features that are important, and everything else you try to, to throw away. Um, so that's what we started doing. So we developed a number of um, tools to help us with that. So we're just throwing away erroneous points, um, subsampling the, the, those point sets really quickly. Um, and after a while, what we also managed to do is actually develop a system to robustly triangulate those um, massive point clouds, especially for tunnels and, and cave systems. And I'll come back to that a bit later. So, um, on to another example of how we've done that with the, the Mola Yaris uh, data set. Here we have uh, data from four missions, uh, and as you can see, they're, they're all roughly in the same position when they, uh, when they were gathered, but they're all just slightly misaligned. So if you want to use this data, you can't really do much with it, because the misalignment will cause all sorts of errors um, further on. So one of the things you need to do is to be able to bring that back together to orient it correctly. Um, so we've got some algorithms to um, align them properly, and once they're aligned properly, you get a lot of duplicate points because you're, you're actually scanning the same sort of data. So what we then do is to, to subsample it to, to get rid of the, the duplicates so you can get uh, to a manageable um, data set. That's what we've done here. So the, the, the top left, you see where the, the alignment is more or less uh, optimal. You still see that there's a slight misalignment between them, but it's probably as good as I, I can get it at, at this stage. And then you can start to subsample it, and then you can start to see the features in the data set. So this is the Moliano scheme, where you can actually see some of the geology coming through. So you, you see that merged data set um, from those four, four missions all into a single data set. And once it's been in that single data set, I'm not sure if you can really see, but there's a, like a triangulated surface uh, that we fit through it. Uh, I'll show you a better example in a minute. Um, and I'll show you also why that's important. Uh, yeah. So here, then the same point cloud on the right hand side it's a bit visible. Um, you can see the triangular surface that we managed to create from it. Um, a lot of people think that it's quite trivial. Um, I can assure you it's not. Um, when you just have points in space, you don't know what, what's a boundary, what's noise, what's not, what, what is important and what's not important. Um, so we, we, we had to play with that. Um, and one of the biggest problems with these sorts of data sets is to know what inside the cave and what's outside. What you see in the triangular surface is the boundary between the inside and the outside. So we've developed a system where we heavily subsample the point set to get a rough shape, create a very simple surface through it, and then you start using that surface um, to, to go into more detail, as it were. So you, you start to do it again, but then at a more detailed level. So we've managed to do that for the Mars Galaxy scale, and we've even managed to do that for uh, the choose that data. So this is another scan of the X and Y um, that's been done with the handheld laser scanner. There were actually uh, some misalignments in that data set, but the system that we've developed was robust enough to actually triangulate it. So there was uh, a data set with about 200 million points that we managed to um, create a, a single 
surface from. And finally, I'll show you what we can do with that, because um, in this example on the, on the left, this is an unrelated um, example, but what, what, we, what we have on the surface created from those point clouds, we can take a step further and say, okay, how far are all these points from that surface? So if we have the outside, we know, um, we know where the, the cave or the tunnel wall is, so everything inside is an object, um, either in this case, you can actually see some pipes at the top of the tunnel. Uh, there's some um, cars that have been running around uh, in that tunnel. So these, these items you can pick up. So what we hope to do with um, an action, uh, if we can go back there at a, at a later stage, is to use this system to then say, right, well, yeah, these are items that we, objects that we've detected within um, within X and Y, and then we could either extract those, or we could just say, right, well, yeah, we want, just want to have the outside. I uh, just want to have an idea of the volume and structural uh, information. Alright, I hope that was short enough.